Hello, I'm Steve Forster. Welcome to our project In Pursuit of the Perfect Portfolio. Uh, today I have the pleasure and honor of speaking with uh, Professor Myron Scholes, famous for the Black Scholes option pricing model. Welcome, Myron. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Our project is, is focusing on uh, an elusive concept, perhaps, uh, the perfect portfolio. And, and we'd love to hear your insights in terms of what does the perfect portfolio mean to you? Well, obviously that perfect portfolio does not necessarily exist, but the idea of the way I think about the perfect portfolio is to really think about what investors are interested in. Investors are interested, in my view, on terminal wealth. They're interested in compound return. And they're interested in drawdown. So they would like to, for a level of drawdown, have the best experience they possibly can. Now the problem with a lot of what we have done in finance over the last number of years is forgotten about compound return. We forgot about growth in our portfolio and we forgot about drawdown. What we have done is talked about relative return. We've talked about relative, how we are doing relative to a benchmark. So are we doing better than the Standard Poor 500? Are we doing better than a 60-40 strategy in terms of compounding return and getting terminal wealth enhanced through our activities? The interesting point about average returns or uh, sharp ratios or information ratios, which look at the difference between what we're doing and the benchmark portfolio, is really ignoring the most important part of investment, and that's the absolute return. And the interesting part about investing that is being ignored, so moving to what I think the ideal portfolio should be, which is concentrating on absolute return and not relative return, is that relative return ignores the benchmark itself, ignores the risk of the benchmark itself. So the analogy I like to give is that who's someone on the deck of the Titanic and the music is playing and everyone is very happy to be on the deck of the Titanic because those in the lower deck are dying first. And basically when you have the idea of uh, benchmarks or average returns, you're ignoring really the most important part of investing which is compound return. The average return is a flawed measure it might be able to evaluate whether a manager is outperforming on average, but it doesn't talk about the ideal portfolio and investing. In other words, the problem is when someone is thinking about crossing a river, you don't tell the person if they can't swim that on average this river is only a half a foot deep because the individual is very interested where they're crossing the river now, right? That's the most important thing. And you're going to ask them more questions of how deep is it where I'm crossing or, and because you, you only have one run of time. You don't have an ability to have average. You can't, and it returns are not averages. When we start off in investment, we start with $100 today. If that $100 falls by 50%, today or tomorrow in the investment and then triples thereafter, it'll go from 100 to then it'll go to, uh, to uh, half, so 50, and then triples will go to 150. Or if you invest today and it goes to triples first, goes to 300 and then goes to 150, by halving at that time, it'll still be 150. So the interesting thing about investment is not an horizon of five years or 10 years, but the fundamental question is the, what happens each period of time. So the ideal portfolio must not assume that I have a 10-year horizon. It must assume what happens each period of time in the compounding process because compound returns multiply. They don't average because when you start off with 100, you go to 120, you're now investing the 100 you initially invested and the 20 additional dollars. If you then lose 20, 
on top of, again, 20%, you lose 20% in your original 100 and 20% on the 20 that you left invested. That ends up at 96. And similarly, if you go to 80 to start with, you're investing only 80 and it makes 20%, it goes back to 96. Because why? You didn't invest an additional 20. When you talk about average returns, we're assuming always investing 100 and, uh, in, in the strategy. So the interesting part about compound returns, if we refocus our attention on compound returns, and what affects compound returns, that's the key. Another key of this problem of the ideal portfolio is we've assumed normal distributions. We've assumed constant volatility and constant mean of a portfolio. And, that, and we know that's impossible. You can't have an S&P 500 portfolio and assume that the returns are constant. The interesting part about investing is if cross-sectional diversification is free, as claimed by academics and others, diversify cross-sectionally. If that's free, then it has to be that time diversification is also free. In the sense that, and you can prove mathematically this is the case, that if you have a target level of risk for a given levels of return, okay, then basically if you allow your risk to fluctuate around the target, then it's the case that you've taken excess volatility or idiosyncratic volatility over time. And I'd like to refocus our attention away from the cross-section, which is everyone concentrates on, and think about time diversification or the effects of time on portfolio performance. To do that, we have to ask the question, what's the most important thing in terms of time, when you only have one run of time. You only can cross, if you cross the river many, many times on average, okay, you're fine. But if you cross the river at the 20 uh, foot part of the river and you can't swim, you drown. You don't get back again. You've got one life to live. One life to live. And so in return space, the most important thing in returns is the tails of the distribution of returns. The idea that you could lose a lot of money or you can miss an opportunity to make a lot of money in your performance of your portfolio and how that compounds over time. And so I think the distribution returns are changing all the time. If you have an index fund such as the S&P 500, there's no way the risk of the S&P 500 can be constant over time. The composition is changing. Sometimes technology has a larger weight. Sometimes uh, utility companies have a larger weight. So the volatility or risk has to be changing of that index. That's number one. Number two is the fact that at times the correlation structure among the assets within the index changes. Sometimes there's more idiosyncratic risk. Sometimes most of the risk is done by all the assets moving together, either down as they did in 2007, 2008, or up as they've done in 2012 or so, you know, when the market uh, went up a lot. And so the, the diversification is not there at times when the correlation structure changes. And so thinking about the assumption of constant correlation, thinking about the assumptions of having constant means and constant returns are fine from a theoretical point of view, but it's a one-period model. It's not a multi-period model. You are always associated with the, the well-known Black-Scholes option pricing model. You've had lots of questions about it. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about uh, how it, it came to be. And also if you could comment on uh, there are uh, a wide range of views of not only options but derivatives in, in general. Um, some argue that they're weapons of mass destruction and, and perhaps you could talk about those two themes. Okay, Steve. First of all, you know, there's um, two aspects of the option pricing uh, technology and model. Okay? One is the technology itself, and the other is the model. And the technology uh, was uh, that Fisher Black and I and uh, Bob Merton developed was really trying to think about how to create a replicating portfolio that's 
by a combination, if we have a stock, a combination of stock and bonds, they would replicate the returns on the option. Now, the technology allowed us to have every period of time a changing risk or changing volatility and a changing interest rate and uh, to be able then to think about uh, how that hedging portfolio could be established each period of time and how it would evolve over time. Now, what we developed uh, was a differential equation which described how the option changed with regard to changes in the um, time and, and, uh, and uh, the interest rate and uh, volatility. And uh, you know, the expected return fell away because we had a hedging portfolio or replicating portfolio. So I didn't care about what the expected return was for the, the underlying security. For that period of time. And the interesting, well, we did care about this volatility. We did care about that. And we did care a lot about the uh, interest rate and time. And um, so that problem was that Fisher and I uh, initially and uh, took a very long time to try to think about how to solve this general case. So what we did was we assumed you know, that the interest rate was constant, and we assumed that the volatility was constant, and we got a nice model. Okay? Even though we knew that was false, right? We got a model. Which, got to start somewhere, I guess. Well, we took low-hanging fruit. We couldn't do it a general case without you know, numerically trying to do that. We had to do that in a, uh, in, um, in, in a way that would be numerical, and people wouldn't understand it as well. So what we did is we assume that the interest rate was constant and we assume that the volatility was constant and uh, then we ended up with this called the Black-Scholes model. Now Fisher Black and I uh, used uh, you know the tools we had and assumed that um, you know that investors could set up the replicating portfolio over a very short period of time and allowed time to compress uh, Bob Merton used his technology, which is the uh, Edo processes and the like, and ended up with a kind of differential equation. Uh, Fisher Black and I and uh, Bob Merton, um, you know, had lots of discussions about what was the correct approach or what was approach was more susceptible uh, to uh, really uh, valuing the options. But and basically, it was more of a theoretical distinction, but we always liked the, uh, our approach uh, better than uh, Bob Merton's approach, uh, but we respect, obviously respected his approach and he thought it was uh, really a terrific approach as well. So I think that the uh, derivation of or the Black-Scholes technology uh, and uh, model allowed one to value options and uh, initially uh, we have had a lot of empirical validation over the years as to the import of the option prices that we have seen as giving us information about risks, as I said earlier, in the marketplace. Um, I think that the whole development of, or use of derivative technology allowed for us to change the whole nature of finance. What it has allowed us to do is go from the big, okay, to more individualized, more idiosyncratic, more things that a particular entity, a corporation needs or an individual needs, and away from when I started the profession and uh, Fisher Black and Bob Merton were in the profession, was these things were big. And what finance does and uh, what we've had in terms of financial innovation is the ability to actually compress time, make things faster, do things more than individuals want, and uh, two is to make them more individualized, right? And three is to make things flexible. Flexibility is optionality, or the mm -hmm. idea to be flexible. All three of these things that I talked about, speed of doing things, individualization, and flexibility, all involve options. So they've had huge valuation 
and derivatives have huge implications for our society and ability to innovate and create more things that entities and individuals want in terms of how they manage risks or how they actually uh, transfer risks and also how they build new instruments and securities. So it's not as if derivatives replace other instruments. It's not as if uh, derivatives could be a complement to or a substitute to various other parts of how the economy operates. But fundamentally, they help you do things more quickly, they help you do things more individualized, and they help with flexibility in how one manages their portfolios. And how would you and respond to, to claims that, they're, that they could be used as weapons of mass destruction? Well, the interesting part is that uh, even if I remember correctly, if it was Warren Buffett who coined the phrase weapons of mass destruction, I think what he was referring to was at the time he acquired general reinsurance, there were many, many long-dated option contracts in the portfolio, 20 years, 30-year uh, contracts, and that uh, when he bought the company, he realized that the liability for, was uh, much larger than he had thought when he had actually acquired the company because the payoffs on those options uh, were, or the value of the payoffs in the option were much larger than he had anticipated. I think that uh, that's what led him to say these longer dated options were uh, weapons of mass destruction. But I do believe that the uh, statement uh, that options are weapons of mass destruction has to do with the ability to lever options or use leverage in options. And uh, we also have a myriad other ways to use options or derivatives for uh, leverage or other uh, things, other ways in the economy, but uh, uh, they do have that levered component. Now, you know, again, it's sort of survival of the fittest. One of the interesting things about a derivative or an option, there's one buyer and one seller. You know, I mean, it, it's a zero-sum game in that sense, and it's not, uh, and so if I have a buyer and the buyer overpays for the option, a seller is willing to come in and write that option and basically uh, you know, protect the person in the pricing sense against, uh, against a mispricing or tremendous mispricing. And I think that's forgotten a lot mm -hmm. about this. When market prices fall and derivatives fall in value, then um, other instruments also fall in value, but I think that the uh, fundamental question is, are the prices at, uh, on the best or accurate in the sense of the best estimate, mm -hmm. and does the market really get out of hand? And I think, no, that's not been true. You don't see that over time. Market pricing of options conveys much more information than does the spot markets. You had that in 87 crash, you know, the futures market had much better pricing than the spot market. The spot market wasn't even trading. It was completely asynchronous. While the option markets on the portfolios were giving much richer information to what was happening in the marketplace. It's true that uh, some people will lose money, some people will make money in options if they misuse them, just the same way as people who put all their money into a valiant drug stock or whatever and it collapses in value. Uh, lose money as well. I think that the reason options or derivatives have had a, uh, a misnomer or misnamed is simply because they're the newest ones on the block. You know, the same way as if we had had electric cars or self-driving cars to start with, you know, given the technology that is being developed and will be developed, then we wouldn't allow humans to drive cars. <laughs> but the only reason why humans are driving cars and causing the self-driving cars to have difficulty is because humans don't drive as well as the self-driving cars can drive at the current moment. So uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, that there's, uh, it's always when people want to find something to blame, they tend to blame those things that are new 
And so there's a tyranny of the status quo, there's a tyranny of the herd, what exists first. But if you look at the uh, extent at which uh, derivatives are, ex are still involved in the, and have even grown dramatically since the 2007-2008 crisis, then uh, one would be amazed to say if these are such awful things, why are they still being used so dramatically? It's, you know, Stiglitz, Stigler once said that, you know, survivorship is a very good method of determining value and these survive and they flourish and they grow. Now, it's true that uh, certain things in the crisis of 07 and 08 came to the fore, namely that uh, AIG had mispriced contracts, could that, but that was an internal control problem within AIG. It wasn't something, and if- Not the you know, derivatives themselves. Not the derivative themselves. Yeah. You know, if people want to write derivatives, even if they're fairly priced, if you write derivatives to the extent you can lose all your money by doing it, yeah. fine. But you're making, you're making a little bit. You know, one of the interesting things about writing these options, even on AAA structures, is that you're going to make a little money a lot of the time, and occasionally you take a big loss. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nothing guaranteed that you're going to do that if you don't. So it's the risk management issue within the firm, the governance issue, that counts more so than using these instruments. And so the way I think about the market, the market gives us tremendous amounts of information about how risks are changing in the market. And one of the interesting parts about risk changing in the market is that the option market, among other markets, but the option market tells us a tremendous amount about the distribution of future returns, the distribution of future returns. When we look at a stock, the information in the stock price is rich, it has, but it has two components to it. It has changes in risk and expectations of changes in risk, and it also has expectation of growth or cash flows. If it has two things, you have one number, it's hard to separate the mean effect from the uncertainty effects. While the option market and the beauty of the Black-Scholes technology and Merton follow-on is essentially it decomposes it and tells you what the risk is, okay? Because we have uh, proved that you can value an option based on the idea of assuming that it's the risk-free rate, it's the appreciation rate. So we have a huge market in telling us what tail risks are, which are the most important, and it tells you about the entire distribution of possible returns. Now, the mar why is the market uh, options market so valuable to give us information about risk simply because it's the tails of the distribution that are so hard to measure yet those in the option market who are valuing out of the money put options or out of the money call options are giving us tremendous amounts of insight as to risk as to the future risk that the market that the risk that we see now you say well this the option market is not that far-sighted, it only has three-month options or six-month options or year option. It doesn't have a five-year option, but a five-year option is not important. If you go back to compound return, what's the most important thing is what's going to happen in the next three months, not what's going to mm -hmm. happen five years from now. And that's where the option market has a huge rich richness, a huge richness as far as telling us information about how the distribution of returns is changing. And so using these information, to construct the ideal portfolio, one could change the composition of the portfolio based on risk and how risk is changing. If one can keep the risk of their portfolio constant, you reduce a huge amount of the convexity costs that occur because you allow your portfolio to fluctuate in risk. Why is that the case? Let me give you an illustration. Let's say, I call it time diversification, but if you think about a portfolio, let's say you have a 50-50 strategy. Mm -hmm. You want to have 50% of your money in bonds, 50% of your money in stock. Let's assume, incorrectly, that the risk of stocks is the same and the risk of bonds is zero. Okay. okay. Now, 50-50 strategy. If you have a 50-50 strategy, Let's say you always keep 
your risk at 50% in stock and 50% in bond. Mm -hmm. Let's have an alternative strategy. The alternative strategy I call, that's called the bang bang strategy. Okay. Half the time you're fully invested in stocks, mm -hmm. half the time you're fully invested in bonds. Okay. Now, if you have no skill, that's allowing your strategy mm -hmm. to bang, the risk to change dramatic, you have no skill, your expected return is exactly the same in a bang bang strategy as it is in the 50 50 strategy. Using the analogy of beta, you know, mm -hmm. if half the time you have a beta one and half the time you have a beta zero, then basically you're going to have an expected return of one half the beta or the one half the market return if you have no skills. So your expected return doesn't change. But your, what about your volatility of your portfolio? Your volatility in the bang bang strategy will be about 0.71 of the volatility of the market because you're 100% of the 50% of the time you're 100% invested in stock while the portfolio of the 50-50 strategy, always having a beta of 0.5 or one half the risk, okay, it will give you one half the volatility of the market. So time diversification is volatility management because it affects your convexity cost. And if you reduce your convexity cost, that's free. That is free diversification. But we have ignored in time diversification in the way we think about investment and I think the ideal portfolio has to involve a lot of discussion about time diversification and thinking about how to obtain information about how risks are changing, adjusting the portfolio to take account of time diversification. Interesting enough, in finance and in investment management, we see broadly, most investment management have said, I want to be measured relative to a benchmark. Mm -hmm. I want to be measured relatively. I don't want to be measured absolutely. I want to be measured relatively. And the reason is because they give up the responsibility of asset allocation to whom? This investor or to the institutional man the institution or to the pension fund or whomever else it is. They give up that ability. They want to be compensated on how well they do relative to the benchmark, not absolutely. So the responsibility of investment management is not theirs. They're only a, a component or a provider of service to the portfolio and they ignore changes in risk, they ignore the asset allocation mm -hmm. problem. So the asset allocation problem is the most important. Mm -hmm. And I don't care about diversification. I don't care about cross-sectional mm -hmm. risk. I think that's a smaller component of how your wealth is going to accumulate over time. So, so if I could just jump in here. Sorry. So, so um, if I'm an investor, I care about my terminal wealth uh, or yes. my wealth at retirement. Um, and, and you don't care about volatility, you care about drawdown. Okay, I you care about the downside and, and the right. drawdown. Uh, you, you talked about getting information from derivatives that right. will give me some information. And should, I be, should I be using derivatives uh, as an investor as part of this uh, perfect portfolio to help manage the sure, risk, for sure. example? Yeah, I mean, if I, were, if I were doing it, I certainly would do that. I mean, if you're holding risk, in your portfolio, mm -hmm. that you want to have the lowest cost source of mm -hmm. changing your risk composition or managing your risk. Mm -hmm. And the very liquid instruments that exist in the beta management, the beta mm -hmm. risk management, is, is really the least expensive way through the derivative mm -hmm. market, whether it's the futures markets or whether it's the options mm -hmm. market, ways in which you can adjust your portfolio to manage this risk. Now, I'm not saying necessarily the individual could do that, mm -hmm. but uh, professional management mm -hmm. certainly could do that and do it in a very efficient way. So rely on a professional manager. Once they understand what, what my concerns are in terms of drawdown, then, then we can use these. these See, the interesting, the interesting thing is the optimal structure of investment has a lot of degrees of freedom to it. Mm -hmm. One is that we have in my view, drawdown is mm -hmm. important. And why is drawdown important? Because if you can reduce the drawdown, mm -hmm. then and basically uh, one could achieve a higher terminal value mm -hmm. for their portfolio. Mm -hmm. And it's really the tails that have the best, the most important effect. So what might my, my portfolio look like? So I'm concerned about the tail risk. Uh, what, what might my portfolio look like to help me achieve my goals? Well, the, the interesting thing is every investor has to ask, in a global sense, what the asset constraints are 
You know, am I limiting myself to invest in a, a more limited set of mm -hmm. assets? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. And the second question, and then once one has that constraint of some form or other, then the portfolio can be formed optimally to manage the risk over mm -hmm. time and to optimize the portfolio over time uh, using either uh, either active portfolios or a combination of active portfolios mm -hmm. and passive mm -hmm. investments. And then that optimal portfolio, then the investor would have to determine the level of risk mm -hmm. they want to run at, mm -hmm. that portfolio to be run at. So, so let's talk active versus passive, and maybe we could go back and, and talk about uh, some of your early contributions in terms of passive investing. Uh, what, what, what role did you play early on in, in your career in terms of uh, what now is a multi-trillion dollar uh, industry? Right. In 19, um, right, 1968, when I was uh, leaving the University of Chicago as a newly minted PhD and on my way to MIT as an assistant professor at the Sloan School of Management. I spent uh, three weeks or so in San Francisco evaluating the investment management process of Wells Fargo Bank. Under uh, Wells Fargo Bank was uh, the investment uh, management area was run by Bill Verton and then uh, John McClown. Mac McClown uh, was running the uh, management science group. So I actually looked at what the management science group was doing in terms of asset management and I wrote a report afterwards saying that uh, they had uh, little skills in the inputs to their, in, uh, their, management, uh, um, their uh, management process and they had few clients. So I recommended that instead of uh, concentrating on active management, that they should concentrate on passive management. And uh, six months later, um, John McClown called me up and said he would like to uh, be engaged in research on this idea of passive management because no one had ever talked about passive management before. And I want to distinguish between passive management and index fund management. Index fund management says no tracking error to an index. Mm -hmm. I never thought that you'd want to exactly track an index because of the cost of maintaining mm -hmm. a, a no tracking error portfolio. So uh, what did passive mean to you then? Passive meant to me was just thinking about at the time replicating or being close to replicating an index. but. As the index composition changed, you trade off the basis cost associated with uh, having uh, not a perfectly correlated structure with the transaction cost of having to make the adjustment mm -hmm. instantaneously or to make the adjustments more slowly over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, when McQuown, Mac McQuown phoned me up and said he'd like to see research on this idea, I said that I had. Uh, um, uh, being an assistant professor at MIT and responsible for my teaching and research that uh, I had this fellow Fisher Black who uh, was a consultant in the Boston area. We had uh, several conversations together and he was thinking of setting up his own firm. Maybe he could be the one who travels back and forth between uh, Boston and uh, San Francisco and I would be with him there. And I did describe to um, uh, McClown that Fisher and I had been doing research with Mike Jensen on testing the capital asset mm -hmm. pricing model and that um, uh, and so we started an association. Wells Fargo wanted to have a lot of research done and seeing what we can do passively, not actively picking stocks but passive investment management and it led to uh, um, several papers that I wrote at the time. I thought being an academic was a lot of fun because we do a lot of research empirically and at the same time there would be practical implications of what we were doing and developing a portfolio at that time. So and you, you, you are a, a rare animal in, in the academic world having made major contributions both on the theory side and the empiric side. Can you talk about the, the, the marriage of the two and the importance of that? Because it, it often is, is overlooked in our profession. 
Well, I, I think that, interesting enough, I think that one of the things all of science is trying to do and all of business is trying to do is to see how we can have theory on the one hand and experience on the other hand and bring experience and theory closer and closer together. Because mm -hmm. we always think you need theory first, okay, then you get experience second. And uh, my view has always been, and Fisher Black and other people's views have always been that they're really rich together because if you can have great empirical testing or experience, okay, that helps your theory and vice versa. Without theory, experience is meaningless and without uh, experience theory is meaningless, right? Because everything in science is inductive. I don't care what we say. We don't go from first principles because you have to data mine things. You're inductive and you have to, if you're inductive, you have to be very careful that you don't gather the wrong data and do the wrong things. So without some theoretical underpinning, whether it's in economics or other sciences, you can come completely nonsensical results. And you can, have, and so I think that um, at the time when I was starting off, it would became obvious to me that we would have to combine empirical work with theory, and I enjoyed both of those and think it's very important to our science, very important. And a lot of ways uh, to do the empirical work that I did, there was no data. You know, we had to develop the data, and, and, uh, and I worked very hard to make sure that we did develop the data. And, um, and uh, then as we developed the data, we made that data available to the community at large, and the community at large was then able to do empirical research, which then fed back on the theory. The theory became richer, and the two of them together were hand and glove. And, you know, and some things were rejected, some new things were born, puzzles came about and into the profession, and as a result of that, it builds a much richer science. And I think the interesting thing is what we're trying to do in, in academics is shorten the time, shorten the time from theory to experience. And those who like say- drug, drug, trial, uh, tr drug trials, would that be sort of the analogy, do you think? Or, uh? Well, yeah, I mean, even in, in, in a lot of what we do is um, there's research and development. I always think research and development are misnamed because it's not really research and development, it's research and testing. It's development and testing, and they all feed back with each other. So if you go into drug analogies you're doing in trial, it's testing, testing. Everything is not R&D. R&D is the wrong name. It's not research and development. It's research and testing. It's development and testing, and then back and forth, and that creates a richness. Now, true, you have to be very careful when you're doing that that you don't end up in the situation where you have a dead end because you've you've data mined, you know, and you've garnered from the past information which then tells you about the future. But one of the nice things we have in finance and academics and in, uh, in, in, uh, financial economics is we have a theory and we have a richness to the theory, we have empirical testing of the theory and then mapping back into the theory and also a willingness to throw out you know, what we think is not working and add to things we think is working. And look, a lot of the inventions and innovations that I've seen over my myriad years in the profession came from a theoretical mm -hmm. side, you know, and then they were developed and applied. You know, passive investment, as is said, is, mm -hmm. is, was been applied generally. It's about 40 or so percent of the market now is managed passively. When, when I started and brought that to Wells Fargo and we talked to institutions about it, you know, people looked at us like we're crazy. You know, how can you manage a portfolio believing in market pricing? See, the interesting thing is that why would market pricing work? Market, the ideal portfolio, we have to use market prices. We have to use option prices. The information in these option prices is information. You can either believe the market gives you information or you can say the market gives you no information. If the market gives you information, you use that. That's the way I started off. I say the market has information. You know, the market, let's use the information in the market. Many people don't believe the market has information. You look at the government, Federal Reserve Policy, or other people, they say, oh, the market doesn't have any information. We're going to use that in anything we do. That's crazy. You know, to me, it's because why not get people are putting their money on the table? You know, I mean, even I think we've had these prices uh, of, uh, I don't know if it's legal in Canada. I know it's somewhat 
now illegal in the United States, but you can have these uh, markets. You say, who's going to win the election? You know, they have election markets, right? People say, how can a market know anything about elections? It comes up once every, every four years or so, you know, and they're having these elections. The market is amazing how accurate it is relative to the pundits. They get polls, you know, they do all this stuff. You go to a market, it tells you what the odds are. It, to me, that's a huge amount of information. And that's we got to, we have to use this information. The prices give us information. And we can form portfolios. We can know what's going on. So if the ideal portfolio doesn't use information in the market to do it, it's not an ideal portfolio. And so you need to look at the prices and how the market's telling us information. So derivative markets are telling us information. The uh, spot markets are telling us information. The forward markets in other ways are telling us huge amounts of information. And uh, I think it's better to use the consensus or the wisdom of crowds, mm -hmm. you know, millions of people making decisions, mm -hmm. and that, that's what we're trying to do. Like we're trying to think of now, the whole world is saying, the government in, uh, releases a report every quarter. You know, there's also the null cast. I mean, every day you're getting now, Google is doing searches and knowing how many people are buying this or asking questions about that, you know, so it's, we're trying to figure out how to price, how to get information and use those prices. So what happens when you, you mentioned 2008, 2009, the so-called financial crisis where- 2007, we, 2008. 2007, 2008, where, where we had some major changes in terms of uh, equity prices uh, going down. From, a, from an individual investor perspective, um, um, what, what, what do you think were some of the lessons that, that they should have taken away from that? And, and how did derivatives play into the whole- Well, look, you know, crisis? I mean, I remember that Federal Reserve or other bankers saying it was, it was a bolt out of the blue. Nothing was there. If you looked at the option market, though, the, the put options were, for, were forecasting crisis ahead, the change in the distributional shape. You saw the financial, the financial firms, the tail risks, the put option prices were increasing dramatically as you went into 07. It was like a tsunami was coming, and the market knew the tsunami was coming. The Federal Reserve, I don't care, they don't want to they don't look at the data, fine. They don't want to look at the information and prices, fine. They can ignore that. But the, the market wasn't stupid. You know, the market was already pricing this in. You got OIS spreads were increasing. The options implied a credit. The, the idea of the LIBOR spreads were increasing. You know, the TED spreads were increasing. I mean, credit spreads were increasing. I mean, it wasn't as if this is all of a sudden, you know, my God, this is there. So yes, there's tremendous information in prices and the options market or derivative markets give you this information. You, can, you don't have to use it, but when the reinsurance premiums go up, you know, if you have reinsurance premiums that go up, and uh, does that mean that risk of uh, insurance is going up? Certainly it is, you know. So if risk is going up, then you could use that information or not, you know. And so the market was, had tremendous amounts of information. In fact, uh, if you looked at it, the market, um, all the sectors of the S&P 500, for example, 10 sectors that were in the S&P, all of them had elevated tail risks were being elevated. And the nice part about it is even though crises, if you look historically, don't happen that frequently, you know, millions of people are betting on crises in the elections every day, and millions of people are betting on or, you know, changing their views and protecting themselves. And, you know, it's Darwinian survival of the fittest. If you're going to be out there writing options in the tails of distribution, and you're going to be wiped out pretty soon in a levered market unless you have some skills. We, we've talked about um, many of your contributions uh, to the profession in terms of, uh, in terms of obviously the option pricing model and early tests of the capital asset pricing model. You also did a lot of work in uh, in the area of taxes. How important is that from an investor's perspective? And and what are some of the insights that you could uh, provide in that area? Do we do we overlook the impact of taxes uh, yeah, to well, a I, greater I extent say, than we should? You know, if I were designing a tax policy, when I talk about risk management as trying to keep your risk of your portfolio constant or at your target and not allow it to fluctuate around that, 
I wish it were the case that we would allow investors to adjust the risk of their portfolio as opposed to being locked in through a tax policy mm -hmm. that currently penalizes you if you adjust your portfolio only for the sake of trying to manage its risk. Now, the interesting part about tax management or the things that I've written on in taxes is tax minimization is not the correct model. What the ta is it always the fact is that you have there is a cost to paying taxes, but there's a cost not to paying taxes as well. So if you, there's the implicit return or the lost return that you would have by not adjusting your portfolio. And obviously that if you had a, a time sequence in the optimal or ideal portfolio, then what you'd want to do is if you're managing your risk, okay, it's much easier to tax manage your portfolio if you're trying to just change beta and control for uh, downside risk than it is if you have a view of a particular security. If you have a view of a particular security, you're locked into that asset and therefore the tax costs might be higher because you really love that, you know, and you, and you uh, can't manage your taxes efficiently. But I've always felt that it's possible that if you're talking about beta risk or, or managing the risk of your optimal portfolio, that it's much easier to manage your taxes within that confine than it is if you have a situation where you have a particular asset you love or a mm -hmm. particular asset you don't love. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we could come full circle to, to the, the perfect portfolio. So uh, some of the themes you've talked about, I should be concerned with absolute uh, returns right. as opposed to uh, relative returns, because I, if I only consider relative returns, I'm doing less worse than, than others perhaps uh, in, in a down market. Um, I should be listening to the derivatives market, which has some important information. What about what my portfolio might look like? for a, a typical investor? I don't think that necessarily a buy and hold portfolio or an asset allocation such as a 60-40 allocation is the optimal allocation because um, the risk of a, say an index fund is changing all the time and so I think the investor has to take account of that in deciding on compound return as I said earlier. A 60-40 strategy is an interesting strategy, which is a common strategy to use 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds. I don't exactly know where that came from, by the way. I sort of maybe historically someone said, oh, this gives me approximately the volatility that I want, you know, on average. But on average volatility is not as important as volatility each period. Because if you have average volatility, 60-40, on average, you could have that volatility, but if you can manage the interim volatility and keep it constant, it's much better. A 60-40 strategy or an asset allocation strategy just determined by market weights does not take account of risk at all, or does it take account of return, okay? And so I was saying even if you assume that the returns are constant, we know that compound return is affected by the volatility and by the skewness of the distribution. You know, that is, we've known that from option pricing technology and option pricing theory. But somehow it doesn't come in to any discussion about how to run a portfolio. The option theory taught us a lot about how to run a portfolio, but somehow it's never got into the literature or people have talked about compound return never talk about time diversification as I've described here. So the ideal portfolio has to start talking about time because we only have one run of time. And time is very important. And I want us to refocus on thinking about time and how you run your portfolio depends on how your risk is and how you want to manage your risk over time. I think that there's three ways of making money in, in the markets and if it's the case that, I'll just concentrate on time diversification, but if, as I said, cross-sectional diversification is not putting all your eggs in one basket is a good model, not 
assuming that risk is constant of your portfolio or a 60-40 strategy or whatever strategy you have will be optimal each period of time is also something that is free if you want to readjust to reduce the convexity cost or the compound return drag that you have when taking excess volatility. For, for the average investor, can you explain what you mean by convexity risk? Well, convexity risk is uh, the idea that basically uh, if you had a situation, uh, let me give you the illustration, if you have a choice and let's say your portfolio would have fluctuation plus 20, minus 20, that um, if on average it's zero, that uh, plus 20, minus 20 is not a very good result because if you make 20 percent you know, and then lose 20 percent, you're down at 96 for a $100 investment. If it goes to 80, you only recover back to 96. So the convexity cost is 4 percent in this case. And we know that the greater the volatility, if you have a greater volatility portfolio, you're going to have that convexity cost because the greater the volatility, the more you have the loss return because the volatility effect just that bounces back and forth, that volatility hurts you in terms of compound return. On the, on the other hand, uh, if you have a strategy which has a target level of volatility and you allow your volatility to bounce around that target level of volatility, that's wasted convexity costs. In other words, it's, it has, if you really have a target volatility of, 20, of 10, right, and you allow it to be minus 20, uh, 30, uh, um, uh, 30, zero or something, so on average it could be 10, you've been awaiting, that is, reduces the compound return of your portfolio because you've taken excess volatility. The more excess volatility you take, the more you have lost compound return. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't ever manage the risk of your portfolio to keep it at your target, you have excess volatility. That excess volatility has a huge cost. Let me give an illustration. <laughs> I mean, let's say you had a, a tail loss. Okay, you, you, you uh, took a, a large loss in your portfolio. Now, this is not a normal distribution, it's just a realized loss. It takes a long time to recover. You know? So that's a huge convexity. You've only cost. got one, one chance. One, one run of time. Right. Right? So you, gotta, you take that huge loss, it takes a long time to recover. Or if you sit around you know, and you miss a big gain, it takes a long time to recover. You know? So uh, that, that's the fundamental difference, is that we have to think about those convexity costs and what they're doing to the compound return. What, what do you think of products that are, that are out there that claim to, the so-called target date funds, that, that claim to take into account the, the uh, years I have until retirement, for example, and therefore right. reallocating my um, equity bond split. I'm a very old man at this time and they tell me that I should be in bonds, right? Now, maybe in 1980 if I was a young man at that time and I did invest in bonds, you know, there's an asymmetry of the fact that the bond returns could be very big as well and nowadays it tends to me that there could be a lot of tail losses in bonds. So the risk of bonds today might be far different from the risk of bonds in 1980s. Given, given our current low interest rate environment. Correct. So the idea is why, I, I think that this is a stupid thing because what it's saying is that what you really want to do is say as you get older maybe your risk appetite falls because your human capital falls, but the ideal portfolio should take account of risk, not bonds versus stock. And the target date funds which say when you're young, you should invest in stock, when you're old, you should invest in bonds, is not the correct model. The correct model is risk. When you're young, what risk do you want to take? And what is the risk as a function of your realized return? You know, what is the risk you want to take as to what it has to do with the other parts of your, of your human capital, other parts of your wealth structure? And so the target date funds, which are sort of stylized ways in which you're thinking of numerical asset allocation, are not taking account of what we should be accounting for. What is the risk? And how is the risk changing? And what is the dynamics of risk? You know, nothing, nothing to do with forecasting whether returns are going to be great or not. Just efficient risk management and a new target date fund of the future will be a risk managed fund, not a 
target date fund, not a fund, and not one is saying I have a 10-year horizon or a three-year horizon. I've heard so many people say, I have a 20-year horizon, therefore I should run my portfolio differently from a one-year horizon or a six-month horizon. That's not true. So we it's need false. a new way of looking at, at we need, things. We have a new, we have all the ways. We have yeah. all the ways today are available. We're just not focusing correctly. Yeah. We're not focusing on what we should be. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this relative value performance has taken over. Mm -hmm. Everyone says the, you know, the benchmark is king. If the benchmark is king and we just look at relative performance, when I developed or, or involved with Mike Jensen and, and others who develop performance measurement, it was just to say how can we say this manager is outperforming the benchmark? That doesn't mean if you say he's outperforming the benchmark or not outperforming the benchmark, you should forget about the benchmark. It's stupid. What advice would you have for, for uh, typical investors? I would like to see those who have skills or managers, you know, start dividing, de defining the portfolio that I'm describing and offer that to investors as a way to um, think about this is then the investors can choose different levels of risk, different levels of drawdown mm -hmm. that they can have and different stock, then, then have that as the way to run a portfolio, not ignoring this entirely. So something that's more dynamic. Uh, has to be dynamic. Changing. Has to be dynamic. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Myron, on behalf of uh, investors uh, everywhere, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts with us.